Hello, friends, and welcome back to Freely Nourish, the podcast that empowers you to break the cycle of dieting by teaching you to nourish your body well. My name is Erin. I'm a registered dietitian. I am your host and also the owner of New You Nutrition Counseling. New You Nutrition has been expanding our offering. So now in addition to one-on-one counseling, we also have a variety of digital options for you to, for you to choose from. These options are great for anyone who does not have the time or flexibility to commit to regular appointments with a dietitian or someone who's just maybe not quite ready to make that leap financially. Our one-on-one counseling is great in terms of getting down into the nitty gritty of your individual needs. It also is great to help you figure out the ways in which nutrition can help either with the treatment, management, prevention, et cetera, of any medical conditions that you may have. However, if you are looking for just some general nutrition advice on how to eat better with barriers of things like a busy schedule, a hectic household, um, on inability to, to plan things like that, then I have two courses for you that might be really helpful. The first is our meal planning made easy course. This is a three hour long course, but it's all recorded. So you can stop it and start it whenever you like, and you get a workbook to kind of help work you along with it and help you implement the things that you are learning into practice. This course is for anyone who has maybe kind of recovered from dieting a little bit, but is still not quite sure what to eat or how to make it happen. So very often, a lot of my clients will come to me very kind of shell-shocked after the diet world. They're used to restrictions, they're used to rules, and they're used to structure. And once they realize that, well, diets really don't really work well, what does that mean? What do I eat? What do I, what I'm left with? What, what do I eat? Um, so this course is for those people. So if you are someone who that sounds like, yes, that is me, um, definitely check out that digital course. It is going to provide you with some basic rules of how to pull together nutritious meals, but it does it in a flexible way. So we're kind of working on food groups and exchanges and kind of how to build an ideal diet with the flexibility of what it looks like day to day, or even meal to meal. It also gives you lots of planning and strategies for how to basically make that happen. Um, Our lives are busy and and a lot of times we just don't have the time to devote to our own nutrition that we would like to. Um, Many people do like the strategy of cooking on the weekends and then just grabbing things during the week, but there are lots of other ways to make those healthful meals happen that doesn't involve taking up your entire Sunday. So we go through lots of ways to get quick and easy nutrition on the table every night. Um, we also go through a little bit of restaurant nutrition so that if you are eating out because you're just on the go or you're out with friends or a social event or something like that, again, that flexible meal planning strategy is going to work to your advantage to get you to that nutritious balanced meal, regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in. Um, if you are someone where you have a pretty good idea of what healthy eating looks like, you just struggle to make it happen because your schedule is just busy and chaotic, then our healthy eating for busy people masterclass is definitely the course for you. This is a much shorter course. So of course you're busy, right? So it's a much shorter one hour masterclass that again, comes with a workbook to kind of help you implement these strategies into action, but it goes through a little less on the meal planning side and much more on strategies to make it happen. Um, We are working in the context of travel, whether it's traveling with the family over the summer or you're traveling for work. Um, We work in the context that we talk a lot more about eating at restaurants or work events, because a lot of times what I hear people struggle with when they have a busy schedule or they're traveling a lot is that their schedule just really isn't their own. And sometimes the choices of what to eat or where it's coming from aren't their own either. Um, So we talk a lot about how to make kind of nutritious choices and also, again, how to build that flexible strategy to where the things that you can control, maybe like a breakfast or snacks or things like that are coming from, from a nutrition and 
a balanced place. Um, we also go through again, very, very quick meal prep strategies, um, for the nights that you are home, um, whether it is, you know, strategies to get things ready in order to send everybody off to soccer practice strategies to have things ready when you all come home from soccer practice or things that everybody can kind of grab whenever they do find themselves in the kitchen. So check out those offerings. They are on my website under the digital courses, um, tab. And I would love to hear what you think about them. Now for today's episode, this is an episode that I am so passionate about. Um, anyone who's ever heard me talk about this topic knows that it is something that is, I don't want to say near and dear to my heart. It's near and dear to my heart in the fact that I hate it. Um, so, but, um, that said, I can still talk very passionately about it and I'm here to, to share it with you all today. So that topic is keto or the ketogenic diet. Um, keto hit the market. I want to say about about 10 years ago, and it just kind of took the world by storm. Um, now you are seeing supplement companies and all kinds of, you know, snack foods, diet foods, et cetera, kind of targeting to this keto audience. Um, and, and it's still a, a very pervasive diet, uh, in, in our culture today. Um, as you can tell by my initial tagline of, you know, my goal, my mission is to help people break the cycle of dieting. So frankly, any diet with a name, um, is, is really not going to be my, my mojo, but this one, in my opinion is particularly dangerous. And I cannot wait <laughs> to explain all of the science of, of why I think that, um, so, so buckle up where we're getting ready to go. Um, so first things first, you know, what is the ketogenic diet, right? So the ketogenic diet is a very low carbohydrate, very high fat diet. Um, and I think that that's important to note because in the research, that's how it's defined. However, in popular media and in, um, you know, just kind of, you know, commercials and, and things like that. A lot of times it's just represented as low carb, um, without that high fat component. Um, so Traditionally, so I guess I should back up and say that we have three macronutrients that are that are in our foods. Um, there's carbohydrates, there's protein, and those fats. All every different food has a most foods have all three or at least two of the three to an extent, but they usually have one that is more kind of present than the other. So for example, a potato has mostly carbs. It's mostly starch. It does have some fat. It does have some protein, but, but the overwhelming majority of the nutrition in there is going to be from carbohydrates compared to say a chicken breast, right? A chicken breast has mostly protein. It does have some fat. Um, and then it has very little carbohydrate. So all of our foods, even though they may be equal. So like, you know, a potato and a chicken breast are probably pretty similar in terms of calories, but where those calories are coming from is different in the potato. They're coming from carbohydrate and in the chicken breast, they're coming from protein primarily. Um, so, so really the ketogenic diet was developed back in the 1930s. Um, it was what we noticed is that kids who had epilepsy. So if you remember, you know, we're kind of taking into account that in the 1930s, epilepsy was a lot more difficult to treat than it is now. We didn't have the, the caliber of medications that we have now. Um, so children were having kind of, you know, these rampant seizures. And what we noticed is that if we put them on a very low carbohydrate diet and a very high fat diet to kind of make up for that caliber calorie, um, uh, calorie surplus, I'm sorry, <laughs> calorie reduction. Then, um, what we, what we found is that they, they stopped having as many seizures. Um, and to be perfectly honest to this day, we still don't really know why that happens. Um, uh, what we do know is that, um, you know, the brain runs primarily on glucose, which is derived from carbohydrates. So what the going theory is, is that seizures are typically, the result of excess brain activity. So your brain just kind of gets overstimulated and it just kind of starts firing. What we think happens is that by taking away that carbohydrate and taking away that glucose source, what ends up happening is your body is forced to, to produce another fuel for your brain. So typically of those, you know, protein, carbohydrates, and fat, your body is using primarily carbohydrates and fat as a fuel source. So that goes for, you know, any muscle movement that you do, making your heart work, your digestive system work, all of those things that require energy, that energy is primarily coming from the carbohydrates and the fats in your diet. Um, it can convert between the two and most of your tissue. So like your muscles, for example, can you 
use both um, and, and do use both very, very frequently. Sometimes, you know, at the same time, if that makes sense. Um, so, so to that end, um, you know, for the most of your body, it doesn't make a difference whether you have a high fat diet or a high carb diet or a diet that has a balance of both, it's going to be able to, to adjust accordingly. The problem is your brain cannot run on fat. Your brain cannot break down fat um, to a molecule that it can use. So what it does is it breaks down fat into what are called ketones. Those ketones can be used by your body. So what happens is your body will break down the fat into ketones. Then your brain starts to run on the ketones. That's a state of what we call ketogenesis. And that's where the ketogenic diet gets its name is that, you know, it's a, it's a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. The idea is that we are replacing most of the carbohydrate that we would be eating with fat. And then because of that, your body is going into the state of ketosis, which it's when, which it's producing ketone bodies to help your brain function. The goal behind, or the theory behind epilepsy, why this works in epilepsy is that those ketone bodies somehow aren't quite as effective as a fuel source for your brain. But in the case of epilepsy, that's probably beneficial, right? Because that we're in a case uh, or a situation where the brain is overactive. So by giving it a fuel source that is not quite as efficient, that actually is kind of scaling back on that overactivity, which is going to then scale back on the amount of seizures that these kiddos are having. Um, obviously that's a very specific case, right? So most, so, you know, now we have much more robust medications that we can give kids for seizure disorders. Um, those medications are very effective and pretty much everybody in the, in the pediatric neurosurgery world agrees that if we can get a kid, a balanced diet with plenty of carbohydrates, that is better. We would much rather manage the seizures with medications if we can, because we don't want to restrict the diet because we don't want to restrict growth. Um, that said, some, some seizure disorders are resistant to medication and other, other seizure disorders, you know, or, or for whatever reason, the kid may not tolerate the medication. Um, the parents may be just kind of very leery of the medication that's being used. Um, they may want to come off the medication for a time because of side effects, things like that. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons why, you know, medication may not be enough. And the ketogenic diet is still used in, in these kids, um, particularly if they're, if they're, you know, treatment resistant to other, you know, pharmacological therapies. Um, that said, these kids are always followed by a team, right? So they're followed definitely by a dietitian, um, and in a whole series of, um, you know, internists and neurosurgeons and endocrinologists and things like that to make sure we're doing routine blood work, you know, like every three months, um, to make sure every we're doing, you know, anthropometric, so measuring height, weight, um, you know, bone density, all of those kinds of things to make sure these kids are getting enough nutrition, because it's a huge concern that if we're taking out probably the largest source of calories in the average human's diet, we want to make sure these kids are still well nourished and they're still going to grow and develop appropriately. Um, so, so to that end, you know, it, it is still used definitely very clinically. It's still very effective. Um, but these kids are definitely tightly monitored because, because of the risk. Now that is not how most people use keto, right? So, you know, I just gave you a whole history lesson on epilepsy and kind of, you know, why we think the ketogenic or ketogenic diet works to treat it. But by and large in the popular media, it is known as a weight loss diet, right? So it hit the, it hit the, um, stage. Uh, probably about 10 years ago when um, somebody published a study that showed. So basically what they were looking at is they were looking at, you know, in the case of obesity and type two diabetes would reducing the carbohydrate intake. So if you know anything about diabetes, it's a mismanagement of carbohydrates. So basically these patients have very elevated blood sugars um, and they have a very hard time handling carbohydrate load. So what that means is that if you have a food that's very high in carbohydrate or very concentrated in carbohydrate, they they can have blood sugar spikes and, and things like that. Um, so the, the theory was, well, if we take carbohydrates out of the diet, like what does that do? Um, and of course, everybody on the, on the ketogenic diet lost a ton of weight, which was perceived to be a good thing. I'll get into in a minute why that may or may not have actually been the case. Um, 
and and their their blood sugar values looked better. Um, so their A1C, which is kind of considered to be like a three month average of your of your blood sugar, as well as their fasting blood glucose. So their actual blood sugar numbers looked better um, or, or lower. So so it looks as if they were managing their disease a little bit better. Um, and then kind of from there, it just you know that study got popularized into the popular media and it just took the whole diet industry by storm, right? The next thing we know, everything was keto. Everybody that was trying to lose weight was doing keto. Um, there's all kinds of supplements and things like that, um, to, to speak to keto and, and whatnot. Um, so I want to kind of spend some time kind of telling you what we know, um, and more importantly, what we don't, um, because I think, you know, as I said, with the kids, you know, taking away carbohydrates or, you know, doing a very low carbohydrate diet, um, is dangerous. It's really dangerous for kids. And in my opinion, it's also just as dangerous for adults. Um, and, and there's some other factors that kind of contribute to, you know, the, the longevity of this diet, the, you know, being able to stick to it, things like that. Um, so, so kind of bear with me as I, as I muddle through what the science actually says. Um, and then of course, you know, you're welcome to make your own, <laughs> your own conclusions. Um, but like I mentioned, there was kind of, you know, there's this hallmark study done that, that showed, you know, it improved, you know, people lost a ton of weight very rapidly. Um, and those who had diabetes, their blood sugar values, including their A1C looked better. Um, and that that's been replicated. That's been replicated time and time again. The problem is most of those studies tap out at three months. Um, just about every study that we have done in humans. And this is actually one of the few diets to where if you saw my intermittent fasting, my review of intermittent fasting, I mentioned that a lot of the data that we do for diet studies starts out in what are called preclinical models. So that can be cell models and they can also be um, rodent models. So like mice and rats. Um, so for intermittent fasting, actually most of the data we have hasn't been done in humans. Most of the data we have has been done in mice and rats. Um, and a lot of times the popular media gets a hold of that and kind of draws conclusions where draws translations where they actually don't belong. Um, we can't just assume because you saw an effect in mice and rats that you would see the same effect in humans because humans are just much more diverse than, than mice and rats who are living, you know, in the same facility at the same temperature, same light exposure, same, you know, diet outside of the intervention, same water bedding, all that kind of stuff. Humans are totally different, right? Like we live totally different lives. Whereas animal studies, like those animals live the same life. The only thing that's different is the diet that you're intentionally manipulating. Um, so, but actually interesting with keto, we have a lot of human studies. Um, and part of that comes from the fact that this was used in kids in the twenties and then the thirties. Um, and, and it kind of has been ever since, um, whether or not it should have been at that point in time, a little questionable, the, the ethics rules and kind of what you were allowed to do. And from experimental standpoint, we're a little different. Um, but anyway, we, we kind of know, okay, well, there's no, you know, huge harm in this. So let's just try it in, in adults. Um, and so, so a lot of the studies we do have are, are from humans. So that, that is a plus. Um, and then, you know, a lot of them in terms of weight loss and, you know, reducing blood sugar, reducing a one C in people with type two diabetes or pre diabetes, um, that, that evidence is pretty strong. Um, the really, the big drawback is that we have no data to suggest really almost none to suggest that that would extend beyond three months. Almost every study has been done. It caps at three months. There are some like two, maybe three that go to six months. And what we see is the same thing we saw with intermittent fasting. We see the biggest effects at, at three months. So basically if you take somebody's weight at baseline and then you take it at three months, yeah, maybe they've lost, you know, 40 pounds, but then at six months, that, that effect starts to go away. So their, their weight is starting to creep back up and their, and their blood sugar tends to do the same. Um, the blood sugar tends to kind of go back up leading to the, the conclusion that this is either not a lasting effect, or it's a diet that people truly cannot stick to for more than three months at a time. At which point my question is, well, why are we wasting our time with it? <laughs> right. If you have diabetes, you have diabetes, you don't have diabetes for three months. Um, so, so you need a solution to it that you're going to be able to stick to for, for more than three months. 